Welcome to this funding opportunity webinar for the Equity and Conservation Outreach Cooperative Agreements. I'm Jay Lee with the Natural Resources Conservation Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We like to call it NRCS for short. Today we'll learn more about this fantastic opportunity. But before we get too far, I do want to introduce the presenters for today's webinar. So let's get our cameras on for just a moment. Super. With me today are Robert Chambers, Pavela Schumacher, and Jada Burrell, each from our Outreach and Partnership Division. We'll also be hearing from Jeffrey Jacobs from Grants and Agreements Division staff. Okay, we can turn off our cameras now and I will do the same. This opportunity is being offered for the second consecutive year, building off the success of the Conservation Collaboration Program and last year's equity agreements. Up to $70 million will be available to fund agreements through this announcement. Applications must be submitted by email to the address listed in the Notice of Funding Opportunity. And we'll go over this and more in today's webinar. Please refer to the Notice of Funding Opportunity for the application submission due date. Pay close attention to that date as applications received after the deadline will not be considered for funding. So don't wait to prepare your packets. We do certainly look forward to seeing your proposals. Let's take a look at today's agenda, which will cover five topics. First, we'll provide an overview of NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and our Outreach and Partnership Division. Then we'll talk a bit about this funding announcement for equity and uh, conservation outreach. We'll also hear from our Grants and Agreements Division, who will walk us through submitting applications and preparing budgets. Then we'll get an overview of how your proposals will be evaluated and how we'll notify you. And last, we'll see some helpful tips and go over some frequently asked questions. These will be posted on our website. Questions not covered can be submitted to the email address shown here, the bottom right slide. And that email will also be in the notice of funding opportunity. We're very happy to answer any general questions regarding the application process. However, we are unable to offer specific guidance on how to craft, structure, or write your proposals. Let's talk a little bit about NRCS and our mission and vision. Our mission is to deliver conservation solutions so agricultural producers can protect natural resources and feed a growing world. We envision a world of clean and abundant water, healthy soils, resilient landscapes, and thriving agricultural communities, all through voluntary conservation. Since our founding in response to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, NRCS provides assistance to conserve soil, water, and all related natural resources on private farm, forest, and ranch lands. Through offices covering every county across the U.S., NRCS provides technical and financial assistance to help producers with planning and implementing voluntary science-based conservation. In OPD, our Outreach and Partnership Division of NRCS, our job is to help all. Uh, our job is to help reach all potential customers. We work through partnerships, some existing and some new to reach individuals and communities. Our partners help us engage with community members to learn about their natural resource concerns and to build trust with our local NRCS staff. Through this funding opportunity, we hope to increase our outreach and partnership efforts even further. These cooperative agreements are not intended for producers to make improvements to their own lands for their own operations. We have other great programs for that. However, this program is aimed at building capacity and relationships. Awardees will 
provide outreach and technical assistance to historically underserved farmers, ranchers, and forest land managers. Awardees will develop community-led conservation outreach projects to help historically underserved producers access NRCS programs and to learn of potential career opportunities, both within NRCS and in agriculture and conservation more generally. Next up, we'll hear from Havala, who will talk about the objectives of this funding opportunity, as well as this year's program priorities. All right, thanks, Jay. So let's talk a little bit about the objectives of this year's funding opportunity. This year, we're looking for projects that include outreach activities that accomplish the following objectives. We're looking for projects that promote the benefits of NRCS programs through education or demonstration of conservation practices. For example, a project might demonstrate the benefits of cover crops to new farmers. Projects might develop community conservation partnerships that engage historically underserved producers to plan and protect farmland ecosystems, watersheds, and wildlife habitat in the geographic areas where underserved communities live. Projects could inform small-scale or urban producers about participation in conservation programs, for example, helping a small urban grower access NRCS funding and technical assistance. And finally, we're looking for projects that support education on, planning for, and adoption of climate-smart conservation practices. These practices help build resilience in agricultural operations of all sizes and types. Now let's take a closer look at our priority areas. In fiscal year 2023, we will prioritize projects that, one, address local natural resource issues. Outreach activities should support an understanding of the NRCS planning process and program implementation and provide opportunities for historically underserved producers to meet their conservation needs. Two, promote potential conservation career opportunities. Outreach should promote career opportunities in conservation by recruiting students from underserved communities or who attend minority serving institutions, including historically black colleges and universities, 1862 tribal colleges and universities, 1890 and 1994 colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, and Asian American or Pacific Islander serving institutions. We want to introduce the principles and benefits of natural resource conservation to these students through education and build an understanding of careers in agriculture, natural resource conservation, and related employment. We're looking to build the future of sustainable farming by preparing a diverse next generation of producers and conservationists. Third, we're looking for projects that promote the adoption of climate smart conservation. Outreach should assist historically underserved producers with understanding the support available through NRCS financial and technical assistance programs to help producers mitigate the impacts of extreme weather events through climate smart conservation practices. Our fourth priority is to encourage conservation in small scale and urban agriculture. Outreach should promote partnerships that improve NRCS's ability to connect with historically underserved producers and underserved communities on small acreage and urban farms and to increase their participation in NRCS conservation programs to help meet their community's needs for sustainable food production. And finally, our final priority is to develop conservation leadership skills and opportunities. Outreach should inform historically underserved producers and underserved communities of leadership programs that will develop community leaders able to help NRCS with identifying local natural resource issues and community conservation priorities as well as advancing NRCS's ability to incorporate underserved community priorities into its implementation of NRCS conservation programs. Take a look at these priority areas one more time in a little more detail. The first priority, address local natural resource issues, is about giving local communities the tools to address their natural resource issues using NRCS planning and program implementation. NRCS has been locally driven since our agency's beginnings. Resource concerns change depending on where you are located and local communities are the best equipped to understand their local needs. For this priority, we are looking for projects that help historically underserved producers and underserved communities 
identify their conservation needs, and then implement NRCS conservation practices and use NRCS planning principles. Projects should provide opportunities for historically underserved producers as defined by NRCS, as well as underserved communities of all descriptions to take a leadership role in identifying and addressing their conservation needs. These conservation needs could be anything that the community deems important, for example, soil health or water quality. The second priority, promote potential conservation career opportunities, is about developing the next generation of conservationists and producers. This means educating and recruiting both the folks who will come work for NRCS, as well as those who will be engaged in on the ground agriculture. We're looking for projects that both make students aware of opportunities and specifically develop the skills and qualifications needed to take advantage of those opportunities. Projects can be focused on NRCS careers like soil conservationist, engineer, or range management, management specialist. NRCS will need a whole new generation of talented specialists in the upcoming years and decades, and we want the individuals in these positions to represent the communities that they serve. Projects can also be focused on careers in agriculture outside of NRCS careers. For example, are there potential beginning farmers in your community who benefit from training and conservation planning skills critical to their success in agriculture? Projects should provide outreach to minority serving educational institutions. Students at these institutions are in the process of deciding what their careers will be and are an important source of new farmers, ranchers, and conservationists. The third priority is about addressing the impacts of climate change. These projects should help underserved producers understand what conservation practices they can implement to lessen the impacts of extreme weather on their operations and how NRCS can help. Note that this priority is not about addressing the causes of climate change, but rather giving producers the tools they need to make their operations more resilient in the face of these changes. The fourth priority, encourage conservation in small scale and urban agriculture, is about encouraging conservation in small scale and urban settings. NRCS conservation planning is important on all types of farms, including urban and small scale urban agriculture operations. NRCS is increasing efforts to provide conservation planning and technical assistance to urban and small acreage producers. We hope that these efforts empower farmers to adopt conservation practices that help manage their natural resources while providing fresh food for their local communities. And this year's fifth priority is about developing conservation leadership skills and opportunities for historically underserved producers and underserved communities. Conservation leaders support NRCS by helping to empower their communities with information to promote the benefits of conservation. Local leaders usually know their communities better than NRCS staff, and by working together, community leaders and NRCS can help communities solve their natural resource concerns. Conservation leaders are able to meet producers that may not have engaged with NRCS and make connections so that these producers can receive advice and technical assistance from NRCS on prioritizing and addressing local natural resource concerns. The role of a conservation leader is about more than just getting information from NRCS to communities. It's also helping NRCS understand the needs of these communities. We're also looking to a new generation of leaders who can help their communities identify conservation needs and implement conservation practices. Next up, Robert will talk about eligibility for this opportunity. Thank you, Havala. In the next section, we'll describe who is eligible to apply, what communities this opportunity is intended to benefit, and the available funding under this announcement. I want to start off by reviewing each of the historically underserved categories as defined in the 2018 Farm Bill. Your proposal should be supportive of activities that help NRCS expand our reach to underserved producers and communities while introducing conservation planning and implementation on working lands. I will touch on the definitions today, but they are defined in more depth in the notice of funding opportunity. The first category is beginning former rancher. 
This refers to a former arranger who has not formed previously or has not formed for 10 consecutive years. They must materially and substantially participate in their forming operation. The next category is limited resource former rancher. A limited resource former rancher or forest owner is a person with direct or indirect gross farm sales, not more than $179,000 for FY 2021. In each of the previous two years, the value is adjusted for inflation on an annual basis. A person with a total household income at or below the national poverty level for a family of four or less than 50% of their county medium household income in each of the previous two years. The next category is socially disadvantaged former rancher. A socially disadvantaged former rancher is a person who belongs to a group that has been subjected to either racial or ethnic prejudice because of their identity. These groups include American Indian or Alaskan Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander, and Hispanic. Finally, a veteran former rancher. This is someone who has served in the military, including the reserves of each branch, and was discharged under conditions other than dishonorable. Additional eligible veterans must meet the definition of a beginning former rancher. So the definition of underserved communities is not included in the 2018 form bill, but rather defined as uh, an executive order. Per executive order 13985 of January 20th, 2001, 2021, underserved communities refer to population sharing of particular characteristics as well as geographic communities that have been systematically denied the full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic, social, and civic life. This includes both individuals who qualify as historically underserved by USDA as well as other groups. Groups or individuals considered underserved <clears throat> includes Black, Latino, and Indigenous and Native American persons, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and other persons of color, members of religious minorities, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus persons, persons with disabilities, persons who live in rural areas, and persons otherwise adversely affected by persistent poverty or inequality. Equity means the consistent and systematic fair just and impartial treatment of all individuals, including individuals who belong to underserved communities, such as those we have just discussed that have been denied such treatment. Proposals should specifically serve at least one of the groups discussed in the previous two slides. This is a list of applicant types who are eligible to apply for this opportunity. This include individuals, Native American tribal governments, both federally and state recognized, as well as Native American tribal organizations, nonprofits, nonprofit and public institutions of higher education, and conservation districts. Please note that local, state, and federal government entities, other than the conservation districts, are not eligible applicants. For profit businesses, are also not eligible to apply. Please make sure that the category you select on your application form, SF-424, aligns with one of these eligible entity types. Failure to identify yourself as one of these applicant types will automatically disqualify your proposal from further consideration. A few more notes on eligibility. Applicants must be located within the 50 United States the District of Columbia, the Caribbean area, which includes Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands, or the Pacific Islands area, which includes Guam, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands. Awards will be made to a single entity. However, 
Applicants are encouraged to enter into partnerships if the relationship between the applicant and the partners is clearly defined in the application. The primary partner would be the sole direct recipient of federal funds and would generally enter into sub ward relationships with project partners. The pro proposal should not duplicate activities from other federal award and must have specific and different objectives. If you did receive funding for a similar project, please describe the purpose of the project and how funds will be used differently under the current proposal. Applications for renewal or supplementation of existing projects are allowed. This means that if you have previously received an equity and conservation outreach award and wish to add deliverables, you can apply to do that in this announcement, which is the only mechanism we would use to add funding to a current agreement. However, if you have a current agreement and just need to add time to finish up, this can be done via a no cost extension and does not require a separate application. If you are applying to supplement your project that is existing, please name that project and clearly describe what you will be doing with the new funds. Up to $70 million is available for the, this funding opportunity. However, the agency retains the discretion to award a larger or lesser amount. Awards should be for one to three years, and each award will be between $100,000 and $1 million. Please make sure that you are requesting at least $100,000 and no more than $1 million, or your proposal will be disqualified. There is no matching requirement of non-federal funds for this award. All allowable project costs can be paid out of the federal budget. There is no competitive advantage to applicants who voluntarily provide cash or in-kind match. Now at this time, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of applying for this opportunity. Jeffrey Jacobs from the Grants and Agreements Division will cover this section. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks, Robert. Your first step will be to download the Notice of Funding Opportunity, NFO. You can start by visiting the 2023 information page on our website at the URL here, which is listed at the bottom of the screen. There will be a direct link to the grants.gov announcement there, or go directly to grants.gov, click Search Grants, and find the funding opportunity using NRCS as the agency and cooperative agreements as the funding instrument type. Once you have located the funding opportunity, you'll be ready for the next step. Links for further instruction on how to use grants.gov are located at the bottom of this web page. Next, as the red arrow is uh, pointing you, you would want to uh, click on the opportunity number to open the announcement. From there, you'll see a tab titled Related Documents, uh, as you can see with the red arrow once again. This tab contains all the information you'll need to apply for this opportunity. Make sure to download and save all documents you find there. A complete application containing all required elements is critical. Without a complete application, we will disqualify your proposal. Congratulations, because we are accepting proposals only via email this year. Once you've downloaded the funding announcement, you can exit grants.gov. These next steps are critical. Some of you may have already may already be registered in SAM.gov. Uh, if so, great, you're ready to go. Uh, use the unique entity identifier issued by the site on all application forms. If you have not registered, do so as soon as you possibly can. We cannot make awards to entities that are not registered in SAM.gov, and this process can take some time. You also want to double check that your registration is current. 
Now that we've walked you through where to find the funding announcement and completing your SAM.gov registration, we'll talk through preparing your application and making sure your budget is good to go. As you can see on this screen, uh, we have prepared application, prepare your application forms. Uh, we have the required forms that are listed. Uh, form SF-424, Application for Federal Assistance on Grants.gov. You can find all of these forms if you go to Grants.gov. Uh, form SF-424A, Budget Information. SF-424B is Assurances. Um, you also have a proposal using a provided template submitted as a PDF or Word document. You also need to provide a, a budget narrative. Uh, certification and disclosure of lobbying activities as well. Uh, additionally, if applicable, uh, you would you should provide your negotiated indirect indirect cost rate agreement uh, with your application. On this page, we have the uh, application template, uh, so you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, and as we mentioned. Once you've completed all your application forms and documents, please email your application and forms to the email address that's listed on your screen there. Next up, we will discuss a bit of budget narrative guidance. Uh, budget narrative guidance, this is uh, the direct cost categories. Um, direct cost categories would include personnel, uh, recipients, employees, not independent contractors. Uh, so contractors would not be a part of uh, personnel. Fringe benefits, again, this is recipients, employees, not contractors. Travel, again, the same thing, recipient employees, not independent contractors. Next category, equipment, uh, generally items costing more than 5,000 each. Supplies, items costing generally less than 5,000 each. Uh, then we have contractual. Uh, these are services purchased to support the award, such as printing, uh, facility or equipment rental. Uh, these are not sub awards. Uh, then we would have construction, but that is not applicable to this uh, announcement, this notice of funding opportunity. Then we would have the other category, and here's where you would include your sub award uh, costs or um, could possibly have a uh, participant support costs could be included in the other category as well. Uh, here we have uh, personnel. A little bit more deeper dive into the category of personnel. Uh, for this category, uh, you would want to identify each position and describe how it will support the project. Identify the specific individuals if they are already employees. Uh, what you would want to include is the annual salary, percent of effort, period of time each will work on the project. Alternatively, you can list an hourly wage and number of hours. As you can see, we have an example, uh, Mr. Ken Jones, uh, outreach coordinator. He would be planning and scheduling workshops and recruits presenters. His salary is $50,000 annually, 50% 50 effort for 12 months, so that would equal 25,000. Or to phrase that a different way, that calculation, you would have $25 per hour, 100 hours over 12 months equals $25,000. So for all your cost categories, you want to be sure that you have a calculation for how the total number that you're stating is derived. Fringe benefits. Um, fringe benefits include, but are not limited to the cost of leave, vacation, family related, sick, um, sometimes em employees insurance, pensions, unemployment benefits. Uh, what you would want to do is specify how your organization calculates fringe benefits. So the example here, fringe benefits is calculated at 25% of salaries and wages. So for that salary of 25,000 times the 25%, you would have $6,250. So again, you have that calculation. Next, we would have a category of travel. 
uh, travel, you would want to uh, describe the purpose, the destination, the dates of the travel, estimated or the estimated length of this trip, and the number of individuals traveling. Uh, you would want to specify if you are using the government rates or you're following an organizational travel policy. And you should provide a copy of that policy. Examples would be uh, we have here uh, two people that are traveling to Washington, D.C. for a two day meeting with the National Association of Women's Farmers. They are going to be requesting airfare, $800 times two people, 1600 total. A hotel three nights times two people um, two hundred dollars so that would be twelve hundred we also have meals uh, you have rental rental car for three days hundred ten dollars a day there's also included local travel for the project manager it's calculated at 50 cents per mile throughout the primary service area 326 miles uh, per month for 12 months uh, so again, as you see, all the costs are broken out, and so we can follow the trail of how this total calculation is arrived at. Equipment is the next budgetary category. Uh, you would only include the cost to purchase new equipment. The cost of renting or leasing equipment would go under the contractual category. For example, to complete objectives number one and number two, a no-till cultivator is required. So XYZ company no-till cultivator model number 123 at $5,555. $5, Next budgetary category is supplies. So you would indicate general category of expendable supplies, including an amount for each category. As example here, uh, there's postage, $37 a month for eight months, so that's $296. Laptop computer is a supply. They're going to purchase one. It's $900, so your total is $900. Uh, projector, one projector, $900 equals $900. They're also going to be making copies, 8,000 copies times 10 cents a copy equals $800. Next budgetary category is contractual. Uh, contractual characteristics. Um, this is a characteristics of a contractor, including versus a sub recipient. So a contractor would normally provide the goods and services within normal business hours. Contractors provides similar goods and services to many different purchasers of this service. Um, the contractor normally operates in a competitive environment. Um, and you can see there's an example of what we're talking about as a contractor. We have Acme Training Company. They're providing a training service at $250 per person. They have three staff members, so they're going to charge $750. Another example of a contractor of Jim Smart Consulting. $40 per hour is his rate. He's going to be working 220 hours over 12 months. So that will be $8,800 in total. Jim Smart Consulting is also requesting travel for his consulting service. So he's traveling 2,000 miles at 50 cents per mile equals $1,000. So we always have that calculation of how this cost is derived. The next category is the other uh, budget category. So include in this category items such as subaward and participant participant support costs. Uh, subaward is an award to another entity meant to carry out part of a federal award. Uh, participant support costs is another one that can be included in other. Uh, usually includes items such as a travel stipend to allow producers. Uh, for instance, to attend work so workshops, uh, subsistence allowances for students attending an educational camp, maybe uh, registration fees paid to allow producers to attend a conference. Um, all of these things costs must be connected to a conference or training event. The next category uh, is indirect costs. 
budgetary category. So I uh, would like to mention that indirect costs for nonprofit organizations with a negotiated indirect cost rate, uh, NICRA for short, are subject to a cap of lesser of the of the NICRA rate or 10% of total direct costs for these awards. So the lesser of those two calculations. Entities without a NICRA may elect to use the de minimis rate of 10% of modified total direct costs. And for the third bullet there, we have a description of what modified total direct costs means. So next we have some of the, uh, the steps that you must complete, the required steps. Uh, so one of the required actions is to obtain a TIN or EIN number from the IRS if your organization does not already have one. The timing of that is that could take up to 35 days, so you want to get active on that. Uh, you want to obtain a unique entity identifier, UEI. Again, if your organization does not already have one, the timing of that is that could take one to two business days. You want to register with SAM.gov. Again, if your organization does not already have an active account, that will take uh, potentially seven to 10 business days. And uh, as we mentioned previously, once your uh, application is fully complete and all the forms, required forms are complete, you will email your completed application to the email provided there. The notice and the timing is that at 11.59 p.m., Eastern Standard Time on the final date listed in the Notice of Funding Opportunity and listed at grants.gov is the final date for your submission to that email address. Uh, here is some uh, support if you need some technical assistance uh, who you can reach out to. For IRS, TIN slash EIN issues, uh, for businesses, there's the number of 1-800-829-4933. For nonprofit organizations, we have 877-829-5500. For SAM.gov related issues, uh, you can reach out to their, uh, visit their federal service desk. Um, they have the email or the address listed there to create an incident ticket, or you can even have a live chat with SAM.gov to correct your issues that you may have. You can also reach them via phone, and the number is 866-606-8220. For grants.gov related issues, they have a phone number and email. The phone is 1-800-518-4726, or via email, support at grants.gov. Next up, I'll turn it over to our my colleague Jada Burrell, who can take you from here. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Now that you've done all the work of putting your proposal and budget together, we'll talk about how we will evaluate your proposal for funding. Although this is a non-competitive opportunity, and we will fund as many proposals as possible within the funding available, we do consider criteria that will help us make an informed decision about whether your organization is prepared to receive federal funding. All applications must be submitted by email no later than 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the date the announcement closes. When we receive your application, you will be sent a notification of receipt email. If you do not receive an email, please reach out to us at the email address here to ensure we have received and are evaluating your submissions. Once the application period has ended, we will download all proposals. All proposals received by the deadline will be reviewed. The first step of the review process is to determine whether your proposal meets the required outline in the NFO. Please make sure that you sent the proposal via email to the address listed here, which is also in the funding announcement. 
We will not consider proposals that are submitted late. You need to make sure you're within the page limit and have not left out any of the forms we requested. Finally, please make sure it is clear how your proposal aligns with the purpose of this funding opportunity. Although we would try to fund as many proposals as we can, we expect to receive more proposals than we have funding for. Conducting this first review helps us make sure we're looking at projects that are appear to have read and understood the notice of funding opportunity. Submitting a complete and accurate application also help us give confidence that you and your organization are prepared to manage a federal award. If anything, and the NFO is confusing, reach out to the email address provided before you submit your application. Your proposal will be based on what you submit before the deadline. Here are a few more elements that we will be looking for as we conduct our first assessment of your proposal. First, ensure that your proposal does not duplicate activities included in any other federal award. Make sure that you have indicated the type of organization or individual you represent on the SF-424 and that this is included in the list of eligible applicant types on the NFO. For example, if you are an individual, but your SF-424 say you're applying as a small business, we would consider your you ineligible. Make sure your SAM.gov registration is current and does not contain any limitations on your ability to receive federal funding. Finally, and hopefully this goes without saying, but represent yourself truthfully. As a recipient, you, a partner to the federal government, in administering federal funds to help local communities. We depend on your integrity to deliver on our goals. This slide contains an outline of the application, evaluation and notification process and a timeline for the process. Please note that these are estimates and may change. We'll make every effort to get your application reviewed, award announcements made, and agreements executed as promptly as possible. Applications must be submitted no later than 1159 on the closing date listed in a notice of funding opportunity. After completing our review, we expect to notify successful and unsuccessful applicants by May 2023. Some final tips as you complete your proposal. Don't wait until the last minute. If there are technical issues, you want to give yourself time to resolve them. And SAMS.gov and other required registrations can take some time. Read the full notice of funding opportunity. Make sure that your proposal contains all required elements that your project aligns with of this year's priorities and that your project meet the purpose, the purpose of this funding opportunity. Make sure you craft a, your proposal in such a way that a reviewer can easily confirm all these items. Align your project proposal narrative and budget narrative. Your budget should contain enough details that we have a good idea how you will be spending federal funds and how expenses are related to your project. As described in your narrative, double check that all costs you're submitting as part of your project are allocable. Make sure your proposal meets the required content and format included in page limits. Double check the NFO again to make sure you're not missing anything. Get input from partners. Do producers and others in, in your community feel the project would be of benefit? Do they have any questions after reading your proposal? Make sure someone reading the proposal understands what you intend to do and why it matters. Generally, proofread, proofreading is also a great idea. Consider bringing in individuals who have little or no familiarity 
with your proposal to get their thoughts about whether your narrative is clear. Now, I'll turn this presentation back over to Robert to tackle questions. Thank you, Jada. During our live webinars, we will review the questions that have come in and provide an opportunity to ask any additional questions. As a reminder, USDA staff is unable to offer specific guidance on how to craft, structure, or write your proposal. A recording of this presentation will be posted on grants.gov and the Equity and Conservation Outreach Cooperative Agreement webpage for your review and to share with your colleagues and partners. If you have questions, please submit them to the email listed on this slide. New questions will be added to the Frequently Asked Questions document on our website. Thank you for attending the NRCS Equity and Conservation Outreach Cooperative Agreement Application Webinar.